Here we go. We live. Praise the Lord, everybody. Glad to have you in the house of the Lord tonight. If you're glad to be here, let's just give the Lord some praise for a moment. Can we do that? Thank you for this opportunity. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What a great day today has been. I'm thankful for health and strength and the ability to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. God's blessed us. He's kept us. He's allowed us one more time. And I'm thankful for that. We're going to start tonight if we have any prayer requests. Anybody on this side have any prayer requests, Brother David? We'll do. Sister Lacey? We'll do. Sister Ish? Yes, ma'am. Anybody else on that side, Sister Nadine? Okay. Anybody in the middle? Okay. Sister Weezy? Okay. Ash? Okay. Scarlet? Okay. Sister Margaret? Amen. Sister Michelle? Anybody else in the middle? Anybody on this side? Brother Blake? Yes, Pastor. Angel? Okay, we'll do it, buddy. Mr. Crystal? Rita, Shane, okay, anybody up here, Sister Mary? Thomas Cross, he said on the live stream to pray for his family. Pray for his family. Okay. All right, can we all, oh, I'm sorry, yes ma'am. Okay, we'll do it. All right, let's go before the Lord tonight. Lord, we love you, God, and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, as I mentioned a while ago, for another opportunity to be in this place, God. God, many didn't have this opportunity today, God, but you granted us one more chance, one more chance to be in your presence, one more chance to magnify you, to praise you, to thank you for all that you've given us, Lord. We entered into this place today, God, with a heart of thankfulness. God, being thankful for what you blessed us with, but we come, God, with needs, and we're asking, Lord, that you touch and move upon each and every one of them, every situation, every sickness, every pain, God, every sickness, whatever it may be, God, we're asking, God, in faith believing that you're able to do it. God, there's no one else able but you. God, your word says that there is no other God but you. You said, is there any other Savior? I know not any. God, you're the God that heals us, the God that protects us, the God that keeps us, the God that goes before us. And we're calling upon your name today. God, in faith believing in that mighty name of Jesus that you're going to touch and move. And we give you all honor, we give you praise, and we give you glory because you are worthy of our praise, Lord, this night. And we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask you. Amen.
Come on, let's continue that for a moment. We got time just for a moment, just magnifying. He's great. He's worthy. He's mighty. He's powerful. He's true. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. I magnify you, Lord. I praise you, Jesus. You are worthy, O oh God, of my praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. You may be seated. I was having a pretty rough day the other day. Brother Tripp, it's one of those days you just wake up in a mood, Brother Shannon. It's just one of them days. And while I was having one of those days, it's funny like this, that most of my day had already passed and I was almost done with it. Called Ash. I'm fixing to go by the store and get some stuff for supper. And as soon as I pulled up, I heard somebody call my name. Turned around and there sat somebody that I know pretty well. Somebody that we actually pray for all the time at night. And we began to talk to him and I told him how we missed him and we loved him and we appreciate him and how God can do mighty things in his life. And in a moment that I felt the weakest, it seemed like God gave me an opportunity to show who he is. He's the strongest is what his word says. That when I'm weak, he's strong. When I feel like I just need to go home and crawl in the bed and lay there, he says, no, even in your weakest point, you've got a work to do. Open your mouth and tell somebody how great I am, how mighty I am, how powerful I am, because it doesn't matter what shape I'm in. It doesn't matter how weary, how tired, how broken I am. What matters is, is how great he is. And he's able to do abundantly above all that I can ask or even think about according to the power that worketh within me. Amen. So one more time, let's just clap our hands. Magnify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And thank him for every opportunity that he has given us. We magnify you, O oh God. And we praise you and we thank you, Lord. Because we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sister Heidi, if you will, let's give them the ways to give tonight. We have Givelify. We also have PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. You can send your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. There's also the text to give at 833-883-9311. All of these things work really well. Uh, my favorite is Give Lafay, but that text works pretty good as well, too. I'm thankful for those opportunities, especially for the Bucky in this day and age. Ain't a lot of people carrying cash anymore. Pastor mentioned it the other day, and I, I was guilty of it myself. We went to Nashville here not too long ago on a business trip, me and Brother Cody and some people from work, and we got there, and we had a pocket full of cash and nowhere to spend it. They wouldn't take cash. It was like, wow, never been in this situation before. But guess what? It is a bonus. So I am thankful for each and every means that we have to be able to give to further the kingdom of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. If you'd stand tonight, we're going to pray this prayer with some authority and belief and faith because we know that God is able to do everything he says. Amen. Amen. Say this prayer with me tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, Checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. 
I'm blessed going in, and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Come and give of what God has blessed you with. Thank the Lord. There's an old song that says, I don't know what you came to do. I came to praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. I know it's Wednesday night, but he's still God on Wednesday night just like he is on Sunday night. He's God on Monday morning. He's God on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He's the same God. I can't just praise him when I feel like it, Brother Terrence. I got to praise him at all times. His praise has to continually be in my mouth. And my soul will make its boast of the Lord. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. You may be seated in the house tonight. I like what I feel in the house. Now, like I said, I know it's Wednesday, but the Lord is in this place. I read something the other day. I'm going to read to you real quick. Just like I was mentioning a while ago, a lot of times we... We count ourselves out based on our emotions and our feelings, Brother Bucky. We think, well, I can't do anything for God today because I'm not in the mood. I just don't feel good. But Brother Tenney actually wrote that a bricklayer was laying bricks one day and there was a brick that was cracked and had a chip off the corner that was laying in a pile. He said the bricklayer examined the brick. He added a little mud to the places where the brick needed it and he placed the brick in the wall. He didn't discard the brick. If the brick was completely broken, he found a corner to place the brick on where it could be used. Every brick in the pile found its place 
on the wall. Guess what? We come into this place, some of us weary, some of us broken, but if we just allow the Lord to use us, we'll be part of the wall, amen? And we can be exactly what he has planned for us to do. And we can be exactly what he wants us to do, and it can start tonight. We don't have to wait another day, but it can be tonight, amen? I thank God for his promises. If I can get the kids to come up. Also, the ignited youth to go ahead and come up. We're fixing to pray for these youngins. That God would strengthen them, keep them, protect them, and bless them. Amen. Amen. Because you might look at them as little, but guess what? They're a brick in the wall too. They have a place just like we do, Brother Jackie. And God can use them as long as they are available. Amen. So everybody that will is stand in this place. Raise your hand toward these kids, and we're going to pray that God will touch them and use them and protect them. Lord Jesus, we magnify you in this place. We praise you and we bless you, God. We know, Lord, according to your word, we're fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. God, it doesn't matter how young or how old we are. Each and every one of us, Lord, has purpose. Each and every one of us was created with purpose, God. We were created, God, to be used by you. Another brick in the wall, God, to do exactly what you would have for us. I pray, God, that these children, no matter how young or how old they are, realize their potential. God, that they will begin to realize, God, that they don't have to wait till they get older, but they can be used of you right now. God, I pray an anointing on their life and their families. I pray an anointing on their mind and their hearts. God, that they will leave this place, even in their classroom tonight, Lord, that they will begin to hear your word and not only be a hearer of your word, but a doer also. God, that they will realize, oh Lord, that you have created them, that you have molded them and made them for a work, God, in these last days. I pray your blessings upon their life and their family, and we give you all the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank him for his goodness and his mercy. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead. All right, y'all can head on back. Appreciate y'all. God bless you. Man, that's a good-looking crowd. Thank the Lord. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Aren't you thankful for the Lord, the power of the Spirit? Hallelujah. I'm thankful for his faithfulness. There's an old song that said, Some folks wonder how I smile, even though I'm going through a trial. How can I have a song when everything seems to go wrong? I don't worry and I don't fret. Because my God has never failed me yet. Sleepless days and sleepless nights. But old Job said, that's all right because I've got confidence. God is going to see me through. Hallelujah. I've got confidence that God is going to see us through. Thank you for coming this Wednesday night and uh, for... uh, be Not Deceived, Part 2, which is actually Part 1. Last week was the introduction, and uh, then this week is Part 2. We focus in on Deuteronomy 11 and 16, and uh, um, I'm happy to be here. Amen. I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this since last week. Amen. Thank you, sir. And uh, this, this series came from heaven. God put this in my spirit. I know it right at this moment more than at any other moment. Uh, I'm thankful I have the Lord to turn to, aren't you? Uh, Brother Terrence. There's a lot of things. I'm kind of smart. But there's a lot I don't know. But I know who knows everything. And if I'll trust him, be led by him, 
everything's going to be all right. Do we have enough tonight? Everybody, everybody got a handout that wants one? Good, good. Be not deceived. I want to say this continually, but the paradox of deception is you don't know it when you're deceived. The way, the only time you can combat, combat deception is before it ever comes. You get in a state of deception, it might end up being too late. Anybody ever heard of a fellow named Jim Jones? Yeah. Anybody ever heard of that Hellbot comic group? You get it deceived. Um, it's a tough place to get out of. And uh, I, I want us to know that the responsibility for not being deceived is on us. But the Lord gives us a Bible, a word, truth that we can follow and stand on and make sure that we're not deceived. So without further ado, I'm going to lay a little groundwork. I ask you to hang with me, a little introduction. And, uh, and then we'll get into the word, and I'm excited. I was excited preparing it. I'm excited at this moment, and I think the Lord's going to minister to us. We're going to talk about Moses. He wrote the book of Deuteronomy. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And some of them, of course, he had to write under the influence of God because Moses wasn't there when God said, let there be light. And it was. I have heard it said, and I think there's an argument to it, that when the Lord let Moses see his hinder parts, that could have perhaps been Matthew, I mean Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that Moses did not live. But he was born an Israelite, raised an Egyptian. He was born during a time when the tide has turned. The Hebrew people were once favored and valued very highly by the Egyptian leaders. But now they are feared and oppressed. This Pharaoh has decided that the Hebrew people have grown too powerful and he orders all of the Hebrew little boys to be killed. Now Moses' mama saved him. She put him, she built a little ark of bulrushes, a little watertight uh, container out of brush. She put pitch on the inside of it and the outside of it. She put the little boy in it and put a lid on it and slid him off into the river. One might think that she was putting him in the hands of God and letting the Lord take care of it. The Bible doesn't say that, but the Lord did indeed take care of him. A young lady came to the Nile River to take a bath along with her entourage, and it turns out that this young lady was Pharaoh's daughter, the Egyptian ruler's daughter, and she found the little boy. Under the guiding hand of God, the young lady hired Moses' actual mother to be his nanny. And for the first few years of his life, he was raised by his birth mother on behalf of the Egyptian government. Again, under the guiding hand of God, Moses' mama was able to download truth into him in that short little window, that, that short little time of his birth, uh, and she was able to download into Moses the truth of who he was. She taught him of his heritage, and she taught him of the worship of the one true God. Now, from the time that he was weaned from his birth mother and brought to his adoptive mother uh, was about 37 years or so. And when Moses turned 40, he was enjoying the blessings of living in the house of Egyptian royalty but at age 40, displaying his natural propensity as well as his natural impatience, he came up on a situation where one of the Egyptians was beating one of the Hebrews and Moses stepped in to take care of him. He ended up killing the Egyptian and burying him in the sand. Now Moses doesn't think anybody knows about this. But the next day, two Hebrews are fighting. And Moses gets in the middle of it. And uh, Hebrews rise up against him and they ask him and say, you're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And Moses says, uh-oh, 
they know what I did. Now Pharaoh hears of it and he decides to kill Moses. So in fear of his life, Moses flees to the land of Midian. And there at the watering trough, he connects with the daughter of one of the Midianite priests, ends up marrying this girl and goes to work for her father as a shepherd. Now for 40 more years, Mo Moses lives on what is commonly called the backside of the desert, meaning the lowest of the low in the desert, until such a time as God got ready for the Hebrew people to be delivered from the bondage of Egypt. So through a series, and I'm really summarizing and hurrying, but through a series of divine miracles and wonders culminating with the Passover, Israel is led by Moses under the hand of God from Egyptian bondage. And finally, they are on their way to the promised land that God told Abraham, I'm going to give it to you many hundred years before. Now the hand of God is evident repeatedly in and on the lives of the Israelites. And in spite of their unbelief and their rebellion to him, he sticks with them. How many are glad that the Lord stuck with you? They are, however, as a result of their unbelief and rebellion, relegated to a 40-some-odd year time of wandering around in the wilderness. During this time, this wandering in the wilderness, about 40 years, God miraculously met the basic needs of the people of promise. When they didn't know where to go at night, there was a fire in the sky that led them. There was a cloud in the sky by day. He feeds them every morning with manna. It's a small, sweet little wafer that littered the ground. And every morning they would wake up and fill their basket and they ate that. He ensured during this time of wandering 40 years that they are clothed, causing their shoes and clothes to last for the entire time of wandering and their clothes and shoes never wore out. Be putting Walmart, Kmart, Target out of business. Okay. And he provided them with water. First, they come to a water in hole that's got bitter water, poisonous water. It's nasty. Perhaps if you've read a Louis Lamar book, it's one that's got alkali all across the top of it, and you can't drink it. And uh, the Lord told Moses there's a tree planted there by the water. He said, grab that tree and throw it into the water. And when he threw it into the water, Brother Terrence, it was made sweet. And so they were able to drink. And then it was later on, I believe, in the 17th chapter of Exodus that they, they are again thirsty. And the Lord told Moses to smite the rock with his staff. So hit the rock. And when he hit the rock, a flow of water came out of it. And the people were able to drink. On the second occasion, is in the book of Numbers. The people are in the desert. They're hot, they're dry, they're parched. They're belly aching and moaning and complaining. And let me tell you something. I don't know anybody can complain like the children of Israel did. They are flat out letting Moses and Aaron have it. They murmured and complained against, like it's Moses and Aaron's fault. They said, we'd rather have died back there in Egypt than come out here and go through what we're going through now. Finally, they bellyached to such a place that Moses and Aaron went to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they fell on their face and they sought after God on behalf of the people. And the Bible says, the glory of the Lord appeared before them. And the Lord told Moses in Numbers chapter 20 and verse number 8, he said, take the rod, that's his shepherd's staff, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. And listen to what he said. And speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock so shalt thou give the congregation and their beast drink. So the Lord said, I've got to fix your problem. I'm going to answer your problem. Go and speak 
speak to the rock. Numbers verse 20 and chapter 20, verse number nine, and Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Now, I don't want to move to the next verse just yet. Do I need to explain to anybody Moses wasn't telling them how much he thought of them. No. Moses, Brother David, there's some preaching here. I'm not going to get it tonight, but there's some preaching here. Moses has heard from God for the people. Moses is ticked off at them. He's frustrated. He's angry. His blood pressure is up. And he's letting them know, I'm displeased with you. Brother David, what he's really saying right here, you don't deserve what you're about to get, you sorry, no good for nothing. But he's made a mistake. He thinks he's the one getting the water for him. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice, and the water came out. I'm just going to let you know real quick. First time, the water came out when the Lord said, smite the rock. Second time, the Lord said, speak to the rock, and Moses smote the rock. Water still came out. Say, well, why? If it didn't come out, who the people going to blame? God. So water still came out of the rock because, Brother David, that's what they expected. That's what happened the first time. Okay? So they think everything's just fine. And the Lord spake unto Moses, verse 12, and Aaron. He said, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore, ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now you understand what's happening. Moses was born to lead the children out of Egypt into the promised land, the total package. But now, now the Lord has said, you will not lead this people into the promised land. Now let's talk about this. Why is God mad? He said, you didn't believe me not. You didn't believe me enough to sanctify me. Okay? I looked that word sanctify me up. Are y'all ready for this? And I, it, this is going to come back at you later, so I just want you to get a hold of it. It means, in the NIV says, you didn't honor me as holy. The New Living Translation said, you did not demonstrate my holiness. And the original Hebrew says, because you believe me not to show my holiness. Here's what happened. Moses and Aaron allowed their hearts to be provoked by these murmuring, complaining, unsubmitted people to the point that they corrupted the word of God. Moses allowed himself to be pushed by these people to the point that he violated, corrupted the word of God. Moses and Aaron diminished the power of God in order to show their frustration to the people. The only reason that Moses said, O oh, ye rebels, and the only reason Moses smote the rock not once but twice is because he wanted them to know, I'm mad at you. Yep. Yep. 
because he prayed and heard the word of the Lord too. And together they violated the law of God, the word of God. They did this together because Moses was the leader, but they were always a team. Now, hear me now. The foolishness of Moses' mouth and his frustration, you say, now listen, I want you to hear me right now. Say, man, God, he kind of messed Moses up. No, he did not. Moses messed himself up. Now that's important to note. The foolishness of Moses' mouth. He said, oh, ye rebels, who do you think you are that we had to go and get God to get you water from a rock? That's basically, we did this for you. What he really said, what God really heard Moses say, I ain't fit to lead these people no more. Now, I'm talking about be not deceived, okay? God did not agree with Moses' frustration. And in fact, he took it as a personal affront to him, worthy of judgment. The condition of Moses' heart and Moses' desire for personal validation was revealed. Hear me as I tell you this. A deceived heart manifests itself in carnal frustration, which equals disobedience toward God and is in itself a violation of God's holiness. I said a deceived heart manifests itself in carnal frustration. And this equals disobedience toward God, which is in itself a violation of his holiness. So, looking through the lens of last week, how many was here last week? Remember the lesson. Moses, here's what Moses has done. He has chased this rebellious, unthankful, forgetful, carnal people by taking their behavior personal. He's chased them. Remember last week? You follow these people because I'm going to fix this everything. Listen, Sister Maria, how in the world does he think throwing a fit is going to affect them in a positive manner? But we do it. We do it. Looking at it right now, seems like Moses is a dummy. But I guarantee you everybody in this room has been caught in that same trap. Hear me as I tell you, be not deceived. Listen, I ain't preaching a little red riding hood message of deception. Poor little old dumb girl. My, what big teeth you have. <laughs> uh, no, listen, but that's how we picture this deception. But Brother Terrence, I'm telling you right now, the Bible says Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. I'm telling you right now, he will dress up as the work of the Lord and cause you to be deceived. And you are as carnal as a cuckoo bird. Okay? Hear me right now. There wasn't nothing spirit. I don't care that God calls. But there, there's something to preach to. You know, Brother Shannon, the New Testament says, not only did water come out of the rock, but Jesus was the rock. Yeah. All right? The water came out of the rock, but the people belly ached and moaned and griped and complained, but that wasn't nothing new. But for somebody that was supposed to be in line, in alignment, leading God's people. God took it personal. But Moses has chased this people. And in chasing them, he has become just like them. They called them names, called them 
dumb, said you tricked us, said you brought us out here to die, and all Moses really did was say back to them, nanny, nanny, boo-boo. I'm rubber, you're glue. Okay, that's all. Petty, little old baby junk. Say, what, what about that? Let me tell you something, Brother Blake. It was a big deal to push Moses there. Yeah. The Bible says Moses was the meekest man who ever lived. It was a big deal. But undoubtedly, Brother David, it was a bigger deal to God that Moses not allow himself to be distracted to the point of violating the holiness of God. Now, Moses' deception, Moses' deceived heart. Brother Shannon, he had to think he was justified. And because God answered his prayer, a carnal mind says, he must agree with me. Are you hearing me right now? Moses went and prayed for water to come out of the rock. Moses got mad at the people and showed his behind. All right? He smites the rock and water comes out. Moses assumes God moved. I must be all right. No, I don't think you heard me. Oh, I don't think you heard me. Let me tell you what I just did. I'm not belittling anything in our past, but I'm telling you why for years and years and years we are able to shout our hair down on Sunday night and by Tuesday be backslid. Because just because God moves doesn't mean we're in alignment with him. All right, Moses is just like the people. Here, you rebels, you smart mouths, you old ungrateful people. You know what he's saying to them? Same thing they've been saying to him. He has come down to their level. But now it's cost. Somebody hear me right now. Please hear me in the Holy Ghost. Now it has cost Moses the very thing he was born for. He was born to lead the people to the promised land. The book of Deuteronomy is by and large the farewell addresses of Moses. It's a series of speeches that he spoke to them, but he also wrote them down. And it was during the last month of their wilderness journey. The official purpose, even the name Deuteronomy, means retelling or repeating the law. Its official purpose was to reiterate the law, a reinforcing of the law of God just before they arrived at their destiny. It's important to note that this is not a defeated people with their tail tucked between their legs, but it's a triumphant people on the precipice of a life-defining victory. And as much as Moses desired to lead them with them, he is more concerned with getting them, with them getting it right and living to their fullest potential while holding on to the power and truth of God, serving him and obeying him, and more importantly, giving God the glory for everything that brought them to this place. More than being there, Brother Terrence, Moses now wants to make sure that they're there in the right attitude spirit. That's what Deuteronomy's for. It's a reminder of the law of God. It is a retelling, a reteaching them of how they are supposed to live as the people of promise in the promised land. Now, Deut this is just a side note. I felt like adding it to my notes. Deuteronomy is significant in that every scriptural reference Jesus used during his time of testing in the wilderness and confronting the enemy came from the book of Deuteronomy. Every scripture, Deuteronomy 8 and 3, Deuteronomy 6 and 13, and Deuteronomy 6 and 16. When Jesus spoke to the devil and said, it is written, he quoted from Deuteronomy, a retelling of the law, a people being prepared to enter the promised land. 
Now the last verse of chapter 10, Deuteronomy 10 and 22, this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel that will cross into the promised land. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons. That's 70. A score is 20. So 20 times 3 is 60 and 10 makes 70. And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of the heaven for multitude. What did he just tell them? And I got to get a new battery for my pointer. Let me do a little bit of talking on this side. When your fathers went down to Egypt, there was only 70 of them. That was Jacob, his wives and children, their children and their family. There were 70 of them that left Israel and went to Egypt when Joseph was there. And now, everybody say now. The Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of the heaven for multitude. What does that say to them? Come on now. Think about the scripture. What did the Lord tell Abraham? I'm going to make your children as the stars of the heaven. So what has the prophet told the people from the word of God? Huh? You are the living fulfillment of the promise of God. You are the living fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. Sister Leanne, God made that promise when Abraham didn't have no children. And the whoo, and Moses is telling them, look around. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? God kept his word. In spite of your foolishness, in spite of your rebellion, in spite of your outright disobedience, in spite of your faithlessness, God's got a plan for you, and I want you to look around. It's happening. You are as the stars in the heavens. Hear me now, child of God. You have to know who you are. You have to know who you are. You are the evidence that God kept his promise with Abraham. And at the risk of self-promoting my message from Sunday, they are a part of a continuum that started with one and it became 70. And now the only comparison to this multitude of people is the stars in the heavens. Verse number one of chapter 11 now, Moses says to them, therefore, since we have established who you are, we will now establish your responsibility. So we gotta know who we are and we gotta know why we are that, which is our responsibility. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments Always. Hear me when I tell you, you don't get a break from being a child of God. But you don't get a break from being a Christian either. Ever. That's your responsibility. Verses 2 through 8, he tells them you have a responsibility because you're the people. Not only because of you're the people, but you have a responsibility to the people that have gone on before you, and you have a responsibility to the people that are coming after you. You are the people of promise. And verse 2 begins with, And know ye this day. And this is to establish that Moses knows who he's speaking to and he wants them to know who he's speaking to. He is not 
talking to a people who have no history with God, but they have first hand experience with the far reaching hand of God and the close in hand of God. They've experienced it upon themselves in both judgment and blessing upon them and upon their enemies that nobody's let them forget about the exodus and they know Pharaoh was judged and they were redeemed at the Red Sea. It's a reminder of what God did for them. Verse 9 offers a segue from the people of the covenant to the land of the covenant. Because, ladies and gentlemen, when he told Abraham, you're going to, help me Holy Ghost right now, I need you. He told Abraham, he said, your children are going to be as the stars in the heaven and as the sand in the sea. And right after, Brother Blake, that he comes out of coming out on the short end of an agreement because he told Lot, you pick. Lot took the pretty land and he left Abraham with the sorry land. But the Lord said... Woo! The Lord said, lift up your head and look as far as you can to the north and as far as you can to the south and as far as you can to the east and the west. I'm going to give it to you. It's yours. Not only are you the people of God, but you possess the land of God. You possess the place that God created you for. And that you may prolong your days in the land, verse 9 says which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land that floweth with milk and honey. He says, verses 10 through 12, he said, this land ain't like the land of Egypt. He said, in the land of Egypt, if you wanted to water the crop, you had to pump something with your foot or you had to put your foot down in a ditch and dam this one up so it could go over to the next one because Egypt didn't have any natural irrigation. It was flat land and it didn't have nothing but the Nile River and they had to divert water out there. He said, this land is different than the land of Egypt. You won't have to work to irrigate this land God made it with hills and valleys, which means it was designed to be naturally irrigated. Oh, man, I wish somebody was getting a taste of what the Lord is bringing right now. When you get where you belong, it's going to be perfect for you. It's going to be just like God promised it. I love this part. He said, this is a land God cares for. The eyes of the Lord are upon this land from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, every year. Then in verse 13 to 15, he tells them about their responsibility. Their responsibility to the promise, to the people, both past, present, and future, and to the land. He says, it shall come to pass if you hearken diligently to my commandments to love the Lord, serve him with all your heart and soul, and I'll bless the land when you need me to. I will provide food for your livestock that you, both you and they may eat, and then you can eat and be full. But then he skips to verse 17. I'm going to skip to verse 17 because I want you to see what happens if they don't keep up their end of the deal? And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. The covenant has responsibilities. I want you to hear me. I felt this in my spirit. It's not in my notes, but I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me online as I tell you this. God decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah along with two other cities of the plain. But he said, if I can find 10 righteous people, I'll spare the city. I want you to hear me right now. When you look at verse number 17, 
it looks like that the land that we live in is struggling under the wrath of God. If it's not here, it's on the way because they are abominable in everything. They are perverted in everything. The spirit of Antichrist is working, but I want you to know I felt this in my spirit. The responsibility of the people of the name of Jesus Christ can stand in the gap for our entire world. Make sure that you don't have your head down, but you've got your eyes lifted up and you've got your faith lifted up and make sure that your words and your posts and your prayers and your conversations reflect the power of who you are. But verse 16 offers the warning of how it can go wrong. He said, take heed to yourselves. Now, I'm not, I don't want to be ugly, and I don't want anybody to think I'm preaching at them. But rain on that victim stuff. You will not be able to stand before God and tell him the devil made me do it. You will not be able to stand before God and lay your misfortunes off on anybody else in the world. Take heed to yourselves. Let me tell you, you think the devil don't work in church? He does. He does. If he don't, he's got some of us doing it for him. I'm telling you, you have to fight it off. You have to fight off. When the word goes forth, you will have to fight off trying to decide who it's for. Uh, don't act all holy like you don't. I know exactly. I see y'all little beady eyes. All right, let me tell you something, Sister Sheila. Let me tell you what really tells it off. When they won't look at them for a million dollars. They know what they've been doing. Let's get deliverance from that. When the word goes over the pulpit, it ain't for you to decide who it's for, except why owe you. You got to decide that's for me. That don't decide who it's for. If you're thinking it's for somebody else, you're deceived. <laughs> that's a trick of the enemy. Wonder who he's talking to. Wonder who he's talking about. I believe it's Brother Terrence. I knew he didn't. Have, listen, listen, listen to me. I've been around here a minute. I got some corn in my crib. I knew he didn't have what he acted like he did. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know deliverance is in the house. And we, we believe God is setting people free from dope and drugging and having sex when they shouldn't and looking at naked women and men on the internet when they shouldn't. But I want to tell you right now that there's a party taking place in heaven because there are some men and women that are being delivered from being deceived, that are being delivered from being distracted, that are being delivered from trying to be God. I'm telling you right now, there is a wave of purity that's sweeping through this house right now. Purify my mind and my heart and my spirit. We better worship the Lord in this place right now. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, I feel something powerful moving in here right now. There's a purifying fire of the Holy Ghost sweeping through this house. And he came. The Bible said God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That means I'm not servant to my emotions and I'm not servant to my fears, but I'm in control of what I do and I choose to worship the Lord and I choose to submit myself to the King.
Take heed to yourselves. One of the first signs that you're slipping in your walk with God is when you're consumed with what other people are doing or not doing. If you're right with God and you see somebody that's cattywampus, you can't do but one thing. Pray for them. <laughs> Am I doing all right, Sister Sheila? Let me tell you what, ain't nowhere in town getting this kind of teaching tonight. I promise you that. I, th I think we might be the only service in town tonight. <laughs> Will you hang with me for a few minutes? Yes. Think about this. Who's speaking to them? Moses. Why is he speaking to them? Because they're about to experience the interest into the land. And he can't go with them because of his failure. Because he exhibited a lack of faith in God and he failed to acknowledge God's holiness. Even though he felt like he was the one in alignment with God. Truthfully, he was aligned with the people. Which for him, who should have known better, brought judgment. Think about this. Think about this. If it really would get into our head how blessed we've been, Service after service after service, some of us for year after year after year to feel the power of the Holy Ghost when we hadn't prayed, to feel the power of the Holy Ghost when we ain't fasted. If we would realize how dangerous of territory we've been walking in. Because the book says, to whom much is given, much is required. Okay, the only thing, think about this, think about this, how good God is. Think about it. I call on him any time, Brother Kevin, and you know what? He shows up. He don't always show up saying what I want him to say, but he's always there. I've said this before, and I'll probably say it again. I've come into this sanctuary right here before. Cold as a cucumber in my spirit. Lost as a goose in a hailstorm. But not one time did I lift my hands up to him and he said, put them down, stupid, I ain't listening. Not one time. Not one time. His mercy really does endure forever. Think about it, even somebody that's, that's, you know, rolling downhill like the proverbial snowball headed for hell, when, when something happens in their life, they'll show up and become like Abraham, praying and fasting and sitting on the front row and, you know, I mean, and, and calling the whole church. You, you can be a reprobate and something mess up in your life, you call every church person you know try to pray for you. Looking at it the way it is, Brother Terrence, nobody would walk away from God if they were in their right mind. Especially nowadays. So how does it happen then? Deception. It's the only way it can happen. Why do you think the Lord sent me on a mission to tell us be not deceived? Because it's the only hope the enemy has. Think about that. What did the Lord call the devil? He said he's a liar. He's a father of all lies. He was a liar from the beginning and the truth ain't in him. The only thing that can draw people away from God and their responsibility to the promise to the people into the land is to be deceived. Specifically, a deceived heart. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. I'm going to add this. Moses didn't, but I'm going to add this like mine was. Don't get distracted like I did. Enemy tried it on me right before church started. I almost worked. But he forgot I didn't forget this message. Look here. 
In the Hebrew, the word heart comes from the word libab, L-E-B-A-B, and it refers to the inner man, the mind, or the will. Lord, I need you to help me. Slow the clock down. Pay attention to yourselves, the Bible says. Pay attention to yourselves. I hope, Brother Blake, I hope. I'm trying. I know what the Lord wants me to do, but I don't do good at it. When somebody comes to me that's struggling with something and all they're doing is wearing out everybody they can think of, I was just wasting my time. Because I can only help people that can come and say, I've messed up, I've got a problem, and I need help. If they come telling me, Brother Terrence and Brother Justin, Brother Cody and Sister Callie, and, you know, and if you wouldn't have that, that crazy Josh who claps and hollers and yells all the time just getting on my nerves, I can't get nothing out of church. <laughs> Y'all better not be doing that. It'll be on like a pot of neck bones. <laughs> and I'm just using that as an example. Let's not waste one another's time. But if you can come and say, Pastor... It's not my brother. It's not my sister. <laughs> but it's me, Lord. It's me. Guard yourselves. Keep yourself. Watch over yourself. Preserve yourself. That your heart be not deceived. In writing the Proverbs, Solomon shared of his wisdom. That which was a gift from God, his wisdom was, remember? The Lord said, what would you have that I would give you? And Solomon said, I'm just a child. I don't know how to go in. I don't know how to come out. He said, I pray that you would give your servant wisdom that I might lead this so great thy people. So this wisdom is specially designed to help Solomon lead the people of God. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. In the New Living Translation, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. He says, here we go again. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Now, I'm going to say this. I understand there's things you have to do. You've got to go to the bathroom sometimes. But I'm going to tell you right now, we ain't in church that long. And as many of us as in the bathroom before church and during church and after church, hold it once in a while. Amen. And here's what, I, I'm just being facetious about that. Here's what I am saying. Right now, you can't afford to miss one cotton-picking word comes across Amen. this pulpit. Amen. If you have to go out, and it might happen, go home and watch it. Exhibit some hunger to soak it all up. My child, pay attention to what I say and listen carefully to my words. I'm in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27 in the New Living Translation. He said, I want you to grasp this as I speak it. You see, in several verses up above this, he has offered them the alternative to listening to these words. The alternative to heed the word of God is to, hear me now, go the way of the wicked. So you can listen to the word of God or you can live like the wicked. You can go the way of the wicked. Please, please, please don't underestimate the attraction of the way of the wicked. It don't look wicked. It looks good, baby. It's deceitful. It's harmful. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You will not get out alive if you go that way. It is designed to look good, but it is not. But the way of the wicked is the alternative to living according to these wise words from heaven. If you don't listen to the word of God, you will go the way of the wicked. Listening to the word of God, applying the word of God is the first step in keeping your heart. 
Don't lose sight of them. Don't lose sight of these words. Don't be forgetful. Take that hand out home. Hear me now. Take that hand out home. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror above your vanity. But whatever you do, don't forget it. This is simply don't be, do, be doers, not forgetful hearers. These are words not to be stored or saved up for a rainy day, but to be applied now. The enemy is at your door now. He's after you now. Deception is at work now. The beckoning cry of the siren awaits you as soon as you walk out this door. You can't afford to forget what I'm saying. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. Are we up there with you? Yeah, we go. That's an application deeper than just hearing them and longer lasting than just grabbing a hold of them while they're spoken. And I don't mean to be ugly, and I want you to keep standing up and clapping, but don't think that cuts it. You've got to take it and put it in your heart, and put it in your life, and apply it. You've got to get it embedded in your mind. Let these words permeate your being. Verse 22, for they bring life to those who find them. So I looked up, what in the world is, he said, hear these words, pay attention to these words, apply them to your life. And then it said, they bring life to those who find them. So I thought, what in the world, who find them? You're hearing the word, it's being said to you, you're applying it, and it says they bring life. So what does that mean, find these words? Y'all see my conundrum? Here's what it means. Hear them and apply them over and over and over until they become, hear me right now, until they become a part of your personal culture. Finding them is referring to when they are working in you. Because, Brother Shannon, all this is a process. There is not a prayer meeting that we're going to be able to pray where the Lord takes away the enemy's power to deceive us. It ain't coming. It ain't coming. Listen to me right now. Say you struggle with pornography, and there's people in here that do, men and women, okay? One in four United States people struggle with pornography, all right? Say you struggle with pornography and God delivers you because you can be delivered. Do you know you quit looking at naked women and naked men for 21 straight days and your brain will be healed? Literally. It, it, it's the way it works. It, that's a scientific fact. It may vary just a day or two or three for most folks, but it works. But I promise you, if your weakness was looking at naked women on the Internet and you get victory over it where it ain't a deal no more, Lulu is coming by your desk tomorrow. And she's going to have on the same perfume that that old hoochie mama used to wear that you went out with. And you, she's going to walk by your desk and you're going to go. <sighs> Listen to her. I know it sounds a little bit funny, but the deception's always going to be there. You ain't getting delivered from it ever. That's why I feel the Holy Ghost so strong. That's why the Bible said guard your heart. Keep yourself. Pay attention to yourself so you don't get messed up. Because he's coming, baby. He's coming every day of the week. He's coming morning, noon, and night. He's coming after you. Why do you think the devil's after you so bad? Because he knows what God is doing in southeast Missouri through the River Bend Pentecostals. Look at here. Guard. No, take me back. Take me back. I didn't get done. Hurry. I was almost done until you got me ahead. <laughs> For they bring life to those who find them. There's that life, okay? You know, that ain't just the ability to breathe. That's living, baby. Free living. There ain't no more, no more powerful bondage than living under deception. But here's living life free. Look at here. And healing 
These words bring healing to their whole body. You know what your whole body is as defined by the Bible? Spirit, soul, and body. Okay, that's what it is. That means you apply this stuff that it will ensure, I'm going out on a limb, I know, but it will ensure that you have spiritual health, mental health, and physical health. We're struggling with it right now, Brother Blake. We're struggling with that, but that's what the book says. Okay. All right. Now, then it says in 23, let's go there. Guard your heart above all else. Guard it from what? Yes, the way of the wicked. Hey, listen to me. If you don't like onions, the devil ain't going to try to tempt you with a big old Vidalia. The way of the wicked for all of us ain't the same thing. And it's attractive. Okay? You can't be deceived by something you don't want. Okay. The way of the wicked. And the way of the wicked refers to the manner in which they live their life. The way of the wicked is the way they live their life. And the guarding of our heart refers to what both what goes into our heart and what comes out of our heart. Because there may be some dumb, dumb stuff in there that guarding our heart makes sure it stays there till it explodes and dies on its own. Look at here, Psalm 73, 2 through 3. Asaph wrote this, not David. Asaph wrote it. Asaph was a worship leader. He said, but as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish. That word means proud. I'm almost done. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Brother David, that's somebody who's doing something that I was taught I shouldn't. And they're getting away with it. And they look happy. And it makes me wonder, why in the world am I living this way if they're getting away with everything? I think I'm going to give it a try. I didn't put this up there, but Asaph said, you know what? I was all messed up in my mind until I went to the sanctuary. Until I went to the sanctuary. And then I understood. You know something? Brother Terrence, it's a sad thing, but that's the only heaven the wicked are going to know. There's an end coming for them. There's, a, there's, there's a, a, a relationship. There's a comparison. He said, I was envious because they was doing bad and it looked fun and they got away with it. Not only did they get away with it, they were blessed. He said, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. You see, your heart establishes your identity. The heart is the wellspring of your life. If you're jealous and you're bitter and you're angry and you're, you're all messed up, that's what's inside of you. That's why David said, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit, Psalm 51. I told you about that a few times ago. Let me hurry right here. The next four verses carry warnings that are all relational because this is deception is all relational. Eve would not have talked herself into eating of the fruit. Not till she was deceived. She was tricked. All right? 
Remember how Moses got messed up with God? He didn't protect himself. Moses' protection would have been valuing the word of God over the word of man. And he listened to the word of man more than the word of God. God said, speak. Moses got caught up in the heat of the moment because they made him mad and disobeyed God, violated God's holiness. Now, let me tell you this right now. Don't have time to preach it tonight. The people never did know Moses did that. As far as they knew, Moses obeyed God because he smote the rock the first time. He smote the rock the second time. Water came out the first time. Water came out the second time. But Moses knew, and God knew. Listen, verse 24. Avoid all perverse talk. You know what that means? Lying, misleading speech that declares something different than who you are and what has been true about you. If you've been going to church since Moby Dick was a sardine, and you bumping your gums and gossiping and lying and rumor mongering and saying all kinds of mean and ugly dramatic stuff about people. That's what that's talking about. Avoid all perverse talk. You ain't getting a pass on gossip ever. And stay away from corrupt speech. Let me tell you what that means. It's a similar word. They mean crooked. But both admonitions include a second party. Don't you be talking to somebody like you shouldn't, and don't you be listening to somebody talk like you shouldn't be listening to. That's guard your heart. Oh, goodness. Verse 25. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Here's what that means. Stay focused on where you're headed. Rather than, think about it, when you're focused on where you're going and a pretty little bird of butterfly comes flying across and the next thing you know, you're out dancing through the pasture chasing a butterfly and you forgot where you're going and forgot what you're doing and now you're lost. Get focused. Stay focused on where you're headed. The obvious application is Matthew 7, 13 and 14 when Jesus said, enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many are going that way. He said, but straight is the gate, restricted, narrow is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. The many and the few. Please see the contrast between the few and the many. Everybody ain't hearing what you're hearing. Okay. The many are going the way of the wicked. The few guarded their heart. Mark out straight paths for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Is that it? Yeah. It's the same message. The same message as Hebrews 12 and 1. That says, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. The message is purposefully, hear me in the Holy Ghost. Man, I felt this heavy today. Purposefully remove everything from your path that hinders you from staying on the straight and narrow. Give yourself every opportunity to be successful. Start working with the Lord rather than working against him. Working with him is recognizing that causes me problems every time. So I'm going to get it out of my way. Working against him is, Lord, I know that gives me problems, but I like it. So I'm going to leave it here in my path, and it's going to cause me problems. When I holler, would you help me? How many of us have lived our life for God that same way? I want. Now it's time. The end is near. And I faced 
the final curtain. No, it don't work like that. That's why the Bible says, be not deceived. I want God, if he don't want it in my path, let him take it away. I've had people tell me that stuff. That violates scripture. Verse 20. Oh, no, I ain't done with this one. Ask yourself the right questions. Give careful thought to how you live your life and cultivate an awareness that aligns you with the will of God. Verse 27, don't get sidetracked. So ask yourself right now, what do my distractions look like? There's no room for anything in my life aside from that which accompanies, enhances, or takes me further in the will of God. Then he says, keep your feet from following evil. I bring to your awareness as I close the Lord's prayer pattern. When he says, lead me not into temptation. What did I tell you that meant? Do you remember? Lead me not into temptation means I'm surrendering the navigation of my life to you and remind me when I start going places where I always fail. Be God. I'm giving you veto power. Lead me not into temptation means I want to stop the things I go after. I don't want, I know where I'm weak and I know where I struggle and I'm asking you to come help me. Huh? Lead me not into temptation or deliver me from evil. You know what that is? That's when another one of your weaknesses comes and catches you off guard. You weren't going, lead me not into temptation. That's helped me on things I go after. Deliver me from evil. That helps me on things that come after me. I want them all covered. Because you remember a conversation we had about a perfect storm? Bad day. Nothing going right. Wrong person shows up at the right time. And before you know it, I'm done. Not if I guard my heart. The responsibility for not being deceived is mine. Guard your heart. It's a, it's a plan. It's a pattern. Hear the word of the Lord. Apply the word of the Lord to your life. Guard your heart because that's who you are. Don't let things in your heart that make you be somebody you're not. Oh, it happens. Boy, that was so out of character for him. That was so out of character for her. Why do you think that happened? Let something in. What do you think? Mm -hmm. oh, stand with me. Pray for the sick. I desire your prayers tonight. And, uh, Sunday morning at 10's Elements, Riverbend Ignited, and Riverbend Kids, and uh, 11 o'clock is worship. Uh, be there, be square. You can't be here, watch us online. I'm really grateful for our online church. Yeah. Very, very grateful for those that watch us online. Lord, help us tonight. Help us to go in the power of the Holy Ghost and the fear of the Lord. Help us to go with faith. God, I felt, I felt it come back at me two or three times where we're not sure that this is exactly true. But I pray that everybody in here at least has enough faith to put it to the test. I pray, God, that we will apply it to our lives. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be deceived. The enemy didn't even want this talk tonight. The enemy didn't even want this coming out tonight because it's so powerful. God, you've given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. Let us walk out of here with confidence that we're going to stand. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you if you're dismissed.